Four days into free agency, and things have taken a slow downturn. Kevin Durant's holding things up, but through four days, who are our winners? Who are our losers? Who's the best guy still out there? We'll talk about it all today on the Locked On NBA podcast. You are Locked On NBA, your daily NBA podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey everybody, welcome into Locked On NBA, the best way to keep up with the NBA on a day-to-day basis here on the Locked On Podcast Network, free and available on all platforms. Hope everybody had a good 4th of July if you were enjoying and celebrating in any way. The free agency still rolls on for the NBA and we're going to continue to talk about it here on Locked On NBA. We're four days in and I don't think there's been a big signing or a noteworthy move in about 30 hours at this point. Things have really slowed down as the Kevin Durant sweepstakes, the Kyrie Irving, whatever you want to call it, the what are the Jazz doing, hold up the Suns in there as well. It's all slowed down. Teams need to know how all these big dominoes fall into place before the little stuff can. So what a better time to assess who's won and lost the first four days than right now while we're in a holding pattern. And I'm Tony East, the host of Lockdown Pacers, here to join me to do that. David Ramil from Lockdown. He, David, it's been a very, very slow last two days. I, I can't believe you're besmirching the huge acquisition by the Chicago Bulls to land Goran Dragic. I mean, that is just I, – I don't, I don't get it. I, don't, I mean, that's that's the move that's tilting them to a surefire title contender. But to, yeah, to each their own, I suppose. No, you're right. It is a little difficult to see. Like, it seems like – we were just talking about this on Lockdown Heat. It seems like people are – like, the news has – gotten a lot earlier in the calendar than you expect. I remember sitting in Summer League on a number of occasions, and and, and that's when the big news breaks. But here we are. Summer League's yeah, basically started with the California Classic, whatever that might be. And yet, most of the news is done, and everybody's kind of just waiting for either KD or Kyrie or Donovan Mitchell to get moved at some point. But uh, yeah, there are teams that have made some improvements. Those are the winners from free agency thus far. Uh, who do you have first on your list of big winners in free agency this time? Yeah, my first big winner is Denver, the Denver Nuggets. I would not have called them a winner about two seconds into free agency when DeAndre Jordan got announced as a signing by the Nuggets six seconds after it turned to 6 p.m. on June 30th. But outside of that, they get Jokic locked up for five more years. Devon Reed on a standard deal that they can actually use him in the playoffs. That was actually a pretty noteworthy loss for them in the postseason last year that they weren't able to put him in a postseason setting. They didn't lose anyone super significant and the big one, they get Bruce Brown. They get that defensive wing size guy that they have so desperately needed for seasons and seasons and seasons. That's been the biggest hurdle for them in these Western Conference playoffs the last couple of years. I think they have possibly, especially considering the uh, KCP acquisition they made in that trade with Washington, the best yeah. defensive unit they've put around Jokic in a while without sacrificing too much in terms of shooting and playmaking. And that's why I consider them big winners so far. No, that's an interesting point. I actually don't have them on my winner's list. I think the DeAndre Jordan thing kind of <laughs> soured my interpretation of them a little bit. But I, look, I know Nuggets fans are kind of upset. I think they were somewhat devised, uh, divided in terms of the Contavious Caldwell Pope trade. You lose Bill Barton, things of that sort. It, it just seems like a lot of people don't really believe in what they were able to take back, or maybe the loss of Barton was something that they weren't interested in. But uh, as far as the rest of the moves, strong moves on the fringes. And that's basically all you need to do with a roster that's really, really good. I mean, you've got an MVP candidate, obviously, a perennial one in in Jokic. I think you're going to be just fine moving forward, especially if you can get something from Jamal Murray next season. And I think that's the expectation around Denver. So you're you're trying to cement yourself as a stronger team. You're leaning into what you do best, your defense. Uh, You can get just enough offense around the Joker, and you can contend for a title yet again. And I think that's a, a strong summer overall from them. The Jordan Jordan move is still a head scratcher. Like I don't think there's any debating that. And I'm not sure. I'm sure my regular host co-host uh, Matt Moore would have some insight as to why DeAndre was such a good move there. I I, I don't personally see it. Um, do you have any insight as to why Jordan is still in the NBA period, much less uh, with the Denver Nuggets? Because I'm not sure I see it. I've joked with a few people that I've said, I think they signed DeAndre so that Jokic can win MVP because he'll have the best on-off stats in NBA (laughs) history. But no, I don't have any serious – I mean, he's just a statue at this point. Like every team he's been on can barely even get him on the court. So, yes, that one is a serious negative. And at first between that – because I actually liked the KCP trade for them. I mean, I get losing Morris and Barton Hurts, but KCP I think is a fit for what they need. But if, when they signed Jordan, I thought their free agency was going to be minimum guys, duck the tax, right. you know, be a cheapo right. team. But to go over the, the tax line with Brown and 
get other important pieces. And I think they did a pretty good job despite, yes, the very perplexing DeAndre Jordan signing. Give me a winner you've got so far. Uh, I've got the 76ers. I, I think P.J. Tucker, a bit of an overpay, certainly coming from the Miami Heat perspective. It, it's a, a bit of a loss for them. He wasn't necessarily a key player in terms of like their wins and losses, but he was, you know, he's a constant steadying performer there. A guy who always he gives his all. As cliche as it might sound, that's the reality with him. He's got that dog in him, as people like to say. He's a tough defender. He does whatever it takes. You never have to worry about P.J. Tucker. Maybe this was a bit of a resurgent season for him, considering he was somewhat unplayable for the Bucs during their title run last season. But he has that championship experience. He has that toughness. Uh, I think he brings something to the Sixers that they were missing. They certainly didn't have... That kind of toughness uh, in their uh, playoff loss to the Miami Heat, and then they make some other moves for Daniel House, uh, uh, Clint, uh, sorry, DeAnthony Melton. So I think you you shore up again around the fringes, and we know that it seems very very likely that James Harden is going to be taking somewhat of a discount to re-sign there. So given all that, I, it's a pretty strong offseason for a team that was a title contender before injuries kind of sapped their greatest strengths during the playoffs, but. If they're able to retain that core at full strength, they didn't really give up any key players. You didn't have to trade Tobias Harris. You can still move forward with those guys. I, I, to me, this is a really, really good offseason. Again, when you're a strong contending team, when you're a strong playoff team, all you need to do is make minor moves around the edges, and they certainly did that. Yeah, to be able to to get Harden for less, which allowed them to have the room to get House, to get Tucker, that alone would be a win. To also get Melton for Danny Green's contract because he's not right. going to play for a lot of this season. And they had to trade a draft pick, of course. But they don't care about that. They're in championship contending mode. They snagged up the G League MVP from last year very quietly. Maybe that means nothing. But for a team with no assets to snag up a young player who was the best in the minor leagues last year and traveling queen, I mean, yeah, I agree yeah. with you. They had a really good summer. And they didn't, it seemed like at least, have a lot of wiggle room to make moves. But getting hard into to have that sort of space, I think they, they pulled it off. It was a good just, it was a good summer for them. Daryl Moore is good at this job, believe it or not. Yeah, he is. He is. All right, we're running out of time here. Uh, maybe a couple other teams that we think are winners. Uh, the Boston Celtics, uh, I think, to me, have uh, just shown like really strong offseason. Again, coming off of Eastern Conference Finals Championship, uh, you put yourself, again, in a position to even get more. I mean, you could speak about this more clearly than I would, the trade for Malcolm Brogdon. What do you think he brings to the table? Because on paper, it just seems like a really, really great fit. They're not asking him to do much. He doesn't have to do much. He can fit right in. He can play alongside Marcus Smart. He can be a starter. He can be a bench player. He's a contributor. Uh, and the likely addition of Danilo Gallinari uh, once they're able to bring him on board. And, and I don't think they're necessarily done either. They can make a couple other moves here and there on the fringes. But they just it's a good team that got even stronger. Yeah, Brogdon will help them quite a bit because, you know, I think it was really overblown the, like, they need a point guard thing. But he can do sure. the point guard thing and he can be like, okay, Jason Tatum, have the ball. I'm a really good off-ball player. He was 50-40-90 playing next to Giannis. Like, he's shown he can toggle between both of those roles, put some pressure on the rim. Didn't fit with the Pacers. I have to include that because I cover them because of his age and injury history and duplicative skill set with Tyrese Halliburton. But perfect fit for the Celtics. And they got him at pretty good value, at least. It seems like they got him at pretty good value, stuff that they don't need. A guy outside of their rotation, a pick that they don't care about. Brad Stevens does not care about draft picks. So uh, that, that's a good deal for them. And, and that alone, even if they can't really get awesome fringe signings, like to get a, that significant of an upgrade at, after going to the finals is a pretty big deal to me. Yeah. Uh, I hate I that I'm even going to say this team's a winner. The Lakers okay, have done a pretty good job, David. <laughs> to get to get some young athletes, some wings, some not embarrassing shooters on that team after – what they had issues with last year. I mean, they had very few resources too. They, they found a way to pull it off and get, you know, to get Lonnie Walker like that. Like those young guys don't come available that often. Malik Monk was a bright spot for them last year in this exact sort of scenario. Troy Brown Jr., Toscano Anderson coming from Golden State. They've had a pretty good offseason with some limitations as well. No, I, I have to agree. Uh, look, I mean, they're still in the hunt for the uh, Kyrie Irving sweepstakes. We'll see how that plays out. And perhaps LeBron James may, may or may not be getting subtweeted by the Lakers owner <laughs> via Twitter. But, uh, you know, having said all that, the moves last year were, were perplexing. Of course, they got a lot older. People were kind of on the fence about whether or not that old team could, in fact, put it together for another title run. And they were proven correct that they could not. Uh, if they can bounce back from injury, get Anthony Davis back to snuff, and LeBron continue to be a version of LeBron as he continues moving forward and aging in his NBA career. These are good, smart moves. And I think they'll go under the radar. 
Oh, well, maybe not for Lakers fans. They'll be talking about everything because they are the center of the universe. But having said that, I think it's a really, really smart offseason for them. They get better, they get deeper, and that's part of the problem for them last year. But uh, we'll we'll move on. I think we can put a pin on it here. Unless there's another team that you think is, is really worth talking about. Uh, we'll wrap it up and we'll talk about our losers in free agency in the next segment. But before we do that, just a reminder that betonline.net is still your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including the NHL, Major League Baseball, MMA, and where Kyrie Irving, uh, Kevin Durant, and Donovan Mitchell might possibly wind up next season. Bet online, your continued source for all your wagering information, including live bets, live betting, esports, and scores. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to check in all your favorite sporting and events, including MMA, boxing, golf, so many more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online, where the game starts. Back here on Locked on NBA talking about the losers in free agency so far. About five days fully in. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. Hey, for your second listen, David or Mills at Locked on Heat. Go check them out. They are within the entrenchments of the Kevin Durant, Donovan Mitchell sweepstakes in Miami. And they'll have that all for you over there. As well as the Heat playing in Summer League right now. You don't want to miss that at Locked on Heat. Losers in free agency. I'm guessing we have the same team at the top of our list. They feel like the biggest loser to me. The Dallas Mavericks, am I right or wrong, that they are near the top of your losers list so far? They are absolutely there. The loss of Jalen Brunson, a crucial one for them. Uh, just the acquisition of JaVale McGee, a fine move, but not one that necessarily moves the needle. And coming off a Western Conference Championship, just as we spoke about the winners in the first segment, teams that were already strong contenders making fringe moves, Dallas is on the opposite end of the spectrum. They lose a key player in Brunson, and they don't really shore up any of their needs necessarily. So you're yeah, absolutely a loser in free agency thus far. Yeah, the, they've probably had the best player so far change teams on them in Brunson no going to New York. That alone makes you a big loser, and they didn't have the resources to replace him. They didn't gain any cap space by losing him. That is obviously right. very horrible. And they, you know, the thing about Brunson is too, you know, you get a good player like that in New York, you do it. But I think he's better in a role next to Doncic than as like a lead guy, right? Yes. So in Dallas, to me at least, he would have been a better fit, but they weren't willing to pay up the money. Maybe that will end up behooving them at some point in the future if Cuban's willing to pay up because they haven't been as expensive. But as of now, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to view anything about their summer as a win. They lost the best player and they, they kept Theo Pinson and I'm sure JaVale will help them defensively around the basket a little bit, but that's not enough to, not even close enough to uh, offset the loss of Jalen Brunson. No, absolutely. Uh, and, and look, this is the dreaded concern when any team enters free agency or, or as they're nearing a potential player's free agency is like, do you risk trading them away and then maybe, you know, losing the chance at re-signing them and get something in return? But this is the worst case scenario for the Mavericks, losing Brunson and getting absolutely nothing to replace him. No draft picks, no no other key players, nothing. And so from a Western Conference finalist to a team that took a pretty clear step back, the Dallas Mavericks, I think, atop our list. But uh, the other side of the conference spectrum, the Eastern Conference finalist, Miami Heat, I think, to me, are a loser as well. And maybe some people might be surprised because, again, as you mentioned, they're embroiled in talks for Donovan Mitchell, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving at some point too. Who knows what will happen with the Heat? And that's part of the problem. While they were too busy waiting for the superstar to fall in their laps, they lost a key player, P.J. Tucker, who was probably on his way out. Anyway, they re-signed Victor Oladipo on another one-year prove-it deal. They brought back Dwayne Dedman on a slight overpay. Uh, but they haven't really done anything of note. And you've taken a step back because now you've got Kyle Lowry and Jimmy Butler, older players, another year into their respective careers. Can you continue to you know, waste that time, the short window as it is already with Jimmy Butler uh, by not making some kind of a move? And maybe it all shakes up. Maybe in a week from now, they'll have either KD or Donovan Mitchell or somebody else on their roster. But if not, this is going to be a lackluster offseason, a negative one for them, and that's why I have them as a loser on my bracket. Unless they get Hero on like the steal of all steals extension this summer, it's hard. I agree with you. It's going to be hard for me to bump them out of where they are unless they're able to get one of those stars. And I will never doubt Pat Riley. <laughs> I will never, ever doubt Pat Riley. He always finds a way to make it work out and get the heat back to where he wants them to be. But yeah, I agree with you. As of right now, to lose a guy in your playoff rotation – Yep. And only keep guys who, you know, Vic was good in the playoffs when they needed him, but didn't play every game. Dwayne Dedman's like, there's a million backup centers in the NBA. He's good. He deserves to play for them. But you get what I'm saying. It's hard yep. to not call them losers. They they needed some sort of thing that's an addition or a young something, and they haven't gotten that yet. Absolutely. 
Uh, I've got the Golden State Warriors as a loser as well, having lost a couple of key players in their title run. And maybe none of it matters because they've got their core. You still have Andrew Wiggins. And after that, that's all that really matters on that <laughs> roster. Oh, and that, that Curry guy, he's okay too. But, uh, you know, you lose a couple of key players, uh, rotation players, and it's kind of hard to overlook. Uh, you know, Gary Payton, the second, obviously, I think is a big loss for them. Uh, joins another West Coast rival of sorts in Portland, and it's it's a somewhat of a blow. I, I, maybe I'm overstating things a little bit by calling them losers in free agency, but uh, the money was there. The assumption was that they could have brought back those players, and they didn't. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that Kevon Looney is still a, a, an unrestricted free agent at this point. Is that correct? They, they did get Looney back. That is oh, they did. Okay, so I guess that's a, a, sal- a saving. Well, but for them. but Toscano Anderson was a helpful guy for them the last two years. Otto Porter was in their rotation in the postseason yep. last year. He's in Toronto now. You, know, you already mentioned Gary Payton, like him coming back for the finals was a huge deal, right? Look at this yep. guy they have back. So especially after all the talk about, look at this, they were willing to spend all the money and they get the title. Well, then how the tables turn after the title comes and those guys bolt. I think the DiVincenzo edition will be good for them. Uh, that That's is hard. a nice snag, but I agree with you there. Losers losing three rotation guys. And, and there's a chance it works out, but now they are going to have to probably be reliant on one or two even of their first round picks from last season. Maybe that works out, but you never know what you're going to get. From young guys, you never know what you're going to get from Wiseman. They might have too much inexperience, and they have the pieces to add stuff later, but now they have to think about those trades because they lost all these guys. So, yeah, to to lose three guys who are sort of key in your operation really early in free agency, too, was pretty surprising for a team that's usually willing to spend. Yeah. Who else have you got on your list so far, Tony? The Wizards. The Washington Wizards. They haven't lost anyone substantially important, I would say, but... uh, Lining up to pay Bradley Beal $250 million is <laughs> a little scary at this stage. And if you if you get Bradley Beal on that money, and I'm all about keeping your star, you've got to get sure. someone else. You've got to get other players who are who are really good, and maybe they buy that their roster is good enough with Beal now. But other than that, they got DeLon Wright from Atlanta. Mm-hmm. He's a fine guard piece. They needed that. You know, They did make that trade with Denver that gives them some help, and Anthony Gill resigned. But you know, to me, if you spend that kind of money on Beal, You've got to make an aggressive follow-up move to get a second dude, and they've got a lot of nice players, but they're not even—they weren't even in the playoffs last year. You know, they're still too far away to be lining up to do what they did. To me, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Uh, paying a lot of money to make basically a lateral move, unless there's the assumption that some of the players on their roster, some of the young players, can take a leap, and maybe that's there. Uh, you know, they've got Abijah, uh, they got Rui Hachimura. Maybe Chris Temps Porzingis is finally healthy enough to become a significant contributor at some point. But that's banking on a lot, and it still doesn't necessarily move the needle. I mean, at this point, if even if everything breaks well for them, they seem more like a play-in tournament type team than a strong contender for a title or even a shoe-in for a berth in, in the playoff seating. So to me, it's a, it's very much a lateral move, and to pay Bradley Beal – that much money. And I'm not even saying that he doesn't necessarily deserve, but it does feel like somewhat of an overpay. You knew he was going to get paid, whether it was by the Wizards or somebody else, but it just feels like a little bit over an overpay. Anybody else that you think so? Because I think Minnesota, maybe I'm maybe I'm crazy here, but I think that huge deal for Rudy Gobert is not necessarily – like, it's great for Utah. We could count them as a winner, even though they lost a key player, and they're obviously going to be entering a rebuilding mode. But for Minnesota to be able to throw that away – uh, basically for the acquisition of Rudy Gobert, I don't see it as a great fit. I don't know if I think there's concerns there. Am I uh, am I overstating them as losers? Am I crazy here? I wanted to wrap up on Washington really quick, and then I will answer that question. They have right. Avdia and Achimura and the 10th pick Johnny Davis and Corey Kispert. It seems like, to me, when I saw they did Beal, they were going to use those things to get something good with Beal. <laughs> They're still in that position, but until they do it, I can't call them a winner. Yeah, Minnesota was funny because... Had we done this before the Gobert trade, I'd have been like, winner. Kyle Anderson's great. Bryn Forbes is great. Getting Torian Prince back. Like, awesome. They're taking the right steps forward after right. being a, a, a nice seven seed last year that did well in the first round against Memphis. And then they trade their entire future for Rudy Gobert. So the bet to me is two things for Minnesota. That Gobert is a perfect fit or that Anthony Edwards is amazing next year. Right? And then there doesn't matter if he's that good. They have two awesome players in Cat and Edwards. Maybe those are fine gambles, but that is a lot to trade for Rudy Gobert. And that is, that's the bet. Like if he does not the guy, you don't have the pieces to have that not be the case. So it is a big gamble. And that's why it, it, I think Rudy Gobert is very good. So I'm not yes. as low on that as most people, but uh, it is very risky to give all that up before you have the full star leap for man. 
I think. No, I, I agree 100%. Uh, well, we'll talk about some more of the best of free agents available in our next segment. Before we do that, just wanted to remind you that this episode is brought to you by rockauto.com. With the ever-increasing number of makes and models, it's impossible for your local chain auto parts store to carry the parts you need. You go up to the person behind the counter. Maybe you don't know exactly what you're looking for. They start asking you questions. You get frustrated, maybe even a little embarrassed. Why go through all that? They're just going to find whatever parts their warehouse happens to carry on their computer, the same computer you've got access to at home or on your computer, which means you've got access to a family-owned business that's been serving auto parts customers online for over two decades that's rockauto.com. You can go to their website, uh, just a few easy clicks, and you get exactly what you're looking for. So easy to navigate. You save time, you save money. I've done it many, many times. Uh, I find it to be so convenient. And again, to save money and not have to deal with a hassle, you get everything delivered directly and safely to your door. You can't beat that. Whether you're a do-it-yourselfer like myself or a full-time auto mechanic, rockauto.com is the parts store for you. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck. And then go to the section that says, how did you hear about us? And write the phrase, locked on, so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car or truck will ever need. That's rockauto.com. Welcome back into Locked On NBA. Thanks for making us your first listen as usual. Listen number two, I gave David the plug the first time. Now I'll give it to me. Come over to Locked On Pacers here about the Brogdon trade, the Jalen mm. Smith re-signing, what they could yes. do with some of the pieces they still have available in a very interesting and strange offseason for a Pacers team that never, ever rebuilds. Let's talk about the best free agents left on the market because, yes, the market is slow. Kevin Durant is holding it up. But another reason it might be held up is we're running low on significant names that are worth spending a ton of money for. But before we talk about the lesser names that might be interesting, there are two actually very good players still out there that are held up in the restricted free agency dance. DeAndre Ayton and Colin Sexton. What do you think about what those two guys could be looking at with the rest of free agency coming? I I have no idea what to make of the Ayton situation. And obviously the pursuit of Kevin Durant is the significant cog in that machine being held up there. I, I just, I'm not sure. It looks like, well, we've heard publicly anyways that Brooklyn is not interested in the acquisition of Ayton and any kind of package for KD, whether or not that involves a third team for the acquisition of Aiton seems possible, but uh, I, I'm just not sure how to read into it. And and I thought, look, Aiton's a very, very good player. I feel like a lot of it, like being the number one pick and having that kind of weight attached to that selection makes it difficult for people to assess what he's able to do. There are clear weaknesses in his game, but I think he's overall taken some major leaps throughout his short career. He's a fine player. Uh, he's going to get paid a lot of money. He probably should have gotten paid a lot of that money by Robert Sarver and the Phoenix Suns, but you know they weren't willing to do so. And here we are now. Uh, you know, maybe if they had him under contract already, uh, a deal with for KD would have been done. Uh, who knows? But uh, I guess that's the biggest problem in slowing down where Aiton's future are. Are there any teams that have been clearly linked to? I, I actually heard that Indiana was interested in him. I didn't see that fit. I don't know. Obviously, you would have a lot more insight to that. But are there other teams that are clamoring to get, add DeAndre Aiton to their roster? Yeah, the the part of the Indiana fit, and this is how, you know this. This is how the summer of rumors go. This is a max level player. This team has maximum cap space. Let's link these parties. You know, like sometimes that's as simple as it gets. Now, the reason the Pacers were a little more serious than that is they did try to do a Sabonis Aiton trade in February, and ultimately they got Halliburton instead. So it made sense where they were linked, and the Pacers, and I think the Spurs can get there, are two of the only teams that can just outright pay Aiton what it would take right. to actually like have a serious offer. So that's, I think, part of the holdup with him as well is he kind of has to be signed and traded at this point. So if Brooklyn's not interested, it's either find a way to deal with it in Phoenix or take less than you thought you were worth. And that's, that's a lot of the holdup here is there's just no options left besides somehow he's involved in some very complex trade that either sends him to Brooklyn where Durant's coming from or a third team in some crazy deal. And maybe the Spurs or Pacers can be like a team that absorbs pieces and allows Aiden to get to where he wants to go. But I mean, outside of the Suns it's in, in Nets, it's like really hard to think of an obvious fit for him at this stage. What do you make of his fit in Indiana? Uh, Cause that seems like a, an unusual one. Would it, re would it require also the trade for Miles Turner? Or do you think those two can be complimentary or is it just, rehashing the same Sabonis Turner issue all over. Say, don't make me cover the two center pairing situation for more time. No, what? I mean, that's a thing. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, the, 
he's young and good and the Pacers are are young, right? Like that seems like an not obvious. Good, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're not good, but you know, he's young and good for a team that wants to take a step forward with youth. Like there is a natural fit there, but if it does take Turner, maybe it maybe it takes Miles Turner and the Suns would be okay with that. And they have enough cap space to make it work like that simply, but I don't I just don't know cuz like if you get eight on a max, that's your team basically. Like right. you'll pay Halliburton next summer and you're done. So they, if they're really confident he can be the fit, then yeah, they'll do it. But I don't I mean, it's July 4th and we've heard nothing on that front now. I think we're kind of getting the hints from all parties involved. Yeah. Uh, what was the other big name that you mentioned? Colin Sexton. Any, I mean, oh. there's no way. <laughs> Is right. he a big enough name to merit this? Uh... Uh, I, I guess. I mean, yes. I, I'm sure Colin thinks so. I mean, look, that's fair. <laughs> like, I mean... I, I don't know. It seems like, uh, let's see, at least from what I've heard, it seems likely that he'll just wind up re-signing in Cleveland, right? Unless there's another another team out there. That, again, uh, there's just there doesn't seem to be much of a market for these young players. And so does he sign a, a, a short-term deal knowing that maybe he'll get another uh, payday at some point down the road? Can he sign a one plus one? I mean, I don't know. That's a, it seems tough to exactly figure out where he is. And coming off of injury, like maybe that's the best case scenario for him. And I can understand why he'd like to get paid a lot of money, but if there's not a lot of money to be had and not a lot of teams clamoring for your services at this point, bet on yourself. Uh, I know that's a huge risk and I hate even mentioning it because I'm, I'm definitely a pro player, uh, you know, person when it comes to where teams should or how players should sign with teams and things of that sort. But I, at this point, I just don't see, where his future lies if he's not getting the kind of deal that he expected to get in free agency thus far. An injury hurts. Being a six foot one bad defender definitely hurts. Sure. I averaged 24 points per game on really good efficiency two years ago. Like, I get the limitations of Colin Sexton, but he seems good. Like, it seems like I get why teams wouldn't be lining up for him, but it, it seems like there should be some more of a market than just, well, you're either going to Cleveland or doing what you said and trying to find a way to get in free agency a year or two from now. So I, I, that's why I think he's really good and deserved to be in the breath of Aiton, but I understand yeah. the limitations of why teams aren't dying to give him a restricted free agent offer sheet at this point. Anybody else that's uh, really moving the needle out there in terms of free agency? I know there's a former Pacer, TJ Warren, that a lot of fans seem like interested in acquiring, but he is also another player coming off of injury. What's the report on him? Do we know how close to a full return he is? And what do you see his potential impact being next season? Yeah, he's played 71 games in three seasons. You know, that is the, the headline of his free agency. Four games since Christmas of 2020. Basically Oof. four games in, in 22 months when the next season tips, which is crazy. Look, he was a basically full participant in practice. The Pacers said that in a statement uh, in March of this past season, but there was just no point of bringing him back at that at that stage of the season. Maybe he returns to Indiana because they have no wings and they could just do a prove-it deal there and he liked the franchise. But it, it's tough because he's worth a decent amount as a flyer at this stage as a risk, but not more than a one-year deal because of that risk. So. There's a lot of probably haggling with guaranteed money and things like that. So I don't know where he's going to end up. I don't know what he wants at this stage of his career. A lot of guys, what they desire changes when they sit out for a really long time. So it's kind of unclear what, what his desires are, where he wants to be. So he could be like the steal of the summer. You know, if you get him on your MLE and he's the bubble TJ Warren, I mean, that's a steal at $10 million. But you just have no idea. He's played 70 games in three seasons. Uh, I know Heat fans have certainly been interested in his acquisition, and we talked about it briefly. With Jimmy there. Butler, interesting. That, yeah, that that's the part that I, I mean, I'd have to say if there's a team where I'd like him to sign, it's there and for no no <laughs> other reason than the potential drama that could be brewing there. As if trading for a superstar and blowing up your roster mid off season isn't enough, uh, it's the addition of TJ Warren that certainly is most interesting for me. But uh, is there a team that you think Warren makes a natural fit with, aside from returning to Indiana, or is he no longer a fit there, considering their rebuild? Uh, yeah, the age makes it tough to say. They have no wings, though. I mean, he would he would slot in as a starter day one. So maybe if he wants to do a big one year deal using his full bird, that makes some sense. My thing, my fit for him has always been Memphis, right? They could, mm. they have the room to do it. They they could take on the risk for a year if it doesn't work out. Whatever. We already know we have a million pieces that work and a great coach. I mean, that seems like a, a natural fit for him because then if it doesn't work out, they could slap other guys in. And they just lost Kyle Anderson, so they have room for him in their rotation in theory. But there's not a lot of of dream fits for a guy that. You know, a young team wouldn't pursue and a contender, it's a lot of risk. You know, it's a, it's tough to find. Is there anyone Any other else? Names? 
No, yeah. I was just I was just thinking about it. I mean, we know Gallinari is likely assigned with Boston. Andre Iguodala probably choosing retirement at this point over a return to Golden State. Uh, I, I don't know. Montrez Harrell. Dennis Schroeder, obviously he's, Dennis Schroeder is yeah. an okay player, I think. Um, yeah. But I don't – I mean, what fits are left? Who even needs a rotation point guard at this stage? Yeah, uh, that's a tough one. Thomas Bryant, I think uh, Lakers fans have been interested in acquiring him, but I'm not sure if that's necessarily – uh, a likely scenario there. I guess another player coming off injury. Can he continue to rebuild his reputation as a strong offensive player? We'll see how it all goes. And look, there's this is free agency. You know, a lot of the major moves, and this was a relatively weak free agency class too. Uh, they're over and done with. There's the major trades that are going to happen at some point, perhaps. Maybe they'll happen within the next couple of days or the next couple of hours. Who knows? Uh, maybe it'll take weeks before they're finalized. And I think once those key players are out of the the, the process, then you'll start to see other teams say, okay, now we can move forward and sign some of these guys on better minimum deals or even players aren't willing to take less money so they can join a perceived contender or something along those lines. But for now, I think we're just in the, the dog days of free agency a little earlier than we expected. Agreed, and that will happen when one of the best five players in the league demands a trade a couple hours before the proceedings are set to begin. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to Lockdown NBA today. We are free and available on our platforms, including YouTube, where you can see me and David's beautiful faces this entire conversation. Every, everybody, have a great rest of your day. Back tomorrow, John Corrales and Jake Madison will bring you all the latest and greatest news around the league. Thanks for listening. We'll see you then.